let's just go back to, if I may, your biological mum. Yes. Um, she adopted you. Why? What? Well, she adopted you out. Why? She adopted me out. She was 16 years old when she, when I was conceived. 17 when she gave birth to me, and um, I, her parents forced her to give me up, and she was very reluctant to do so. She tracked me down when I was 27. And by that stage, I'd already searched for my identity um, because, as I said, my adopted mother uh, died when I was six. Mm. And then in the meantime, after my biological mother found me, my then stepmother died when I was 31 from breast cancer. So when I was writing my book, I actually realised that I was afraid to go anywhere near being mothered because I equated it to being to loss. Mm. You know? mm. So when I did meet her, there was no question that she was my mother. It was like looking in the mirror in 17 years' time. It's like, hello, mini me. But she, um, she and I have a lot of issues that we need to work through. I have a lot of trust issues with her and it's been a, a pretty tumultuous journey because she wanted to make up for everything that I lost as a kid. She felt some level of either guilt or responsibility or a desire to, to make up for it because she feels like I didn't have everything that she wanted for me. But ultimately... I'm just so grateful she gave me the life that I had. You know, she lived in Surrey Hills. I'm sure if I grew up in Surrey Hills, I wouldn't have become a surfer. Oh, um, right. And so I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. And she now lives in, in America. She lives over there with her fourth husband, and she has a 17-year-old daughter. And so she has her own life over there. And so she came looking for you at 27. Yes. You're already now one or two world championships. I was uh, just about to win my second. The one. second, right? So was that was that hard for you thinking that? Well, you know, did Gold you bigger. say to her, why didn't you look for me five years ago? <laughs> um, no, uh, she apparently had been looking for me for 15 years. Oh, is that right? Yeah, okay. and okay. I can't imagine it would have been that hard to find me. But uh, obviously it is. Um, it won't be when I'm in the Olympics. <laughs> and um, she, <laughs> and she uh, found my number but then decided to call my dad. And Dad uh, expressed to her that I'm fine, obviously, and uh, but that I was in Indonesia surfing. But he didn't tell her what I did or who I was. But then by that stage, uh, the internet was well and truly going. Yeah, and right. so she Googled me and found out everything about me and then rang me to get hear my voice on my answering machine, but she got me and uh, put us both in a, in a, a difficult position. Um, and she instantly, because I think she was caught off guard, she just started to try and make up for everything on the phone in the first phone call. I was like, whoa, uh, goodbye. And I, <laughs> back off. You know, it was quite confronting for me. It's taken me years to, to process the relationship. And, mm. and, uh, and it took me probably 10 years to call her mum. Even though that she was forced to give you up? Yes. She was one of those 60s, 70s mothers. I've done stories on those... On those Poor women who who were you know made to give up their, their children. It's still difficult to to get past that for you, is it? Yes, and it's because of the protection, the like the protection that I put around myself. I live in a survival mode. Um, because I lost my mother at six, and I just I just become very self reliant and very defiant, and uh, obviously very stubborn and strong will. And so when I set my mind to something, would you like some water? By the way, are you okay? <laughs> Someone dying down the front. Is there any doctor? <laughs> um, it's really important that that we're honest and candid with each other, and we, we're developing that relationship. I haven't given up on it. You know, I, I've expressed my my uh, desire to to get to know her and, and reach out to her, but I do struggle with being nurtured and and mothered. I'm not very good with that. My husband has a hard time with that, but then I call him my wife because he does everything. <laughs> Actually, I should point out, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, I hope you don't mind me no. saying so, but Lane uh, recently had a, can I say the, uh, your age? 40th birthday, yes. 40th birthday Last party. week. Last week, turned 40. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, do you mind telling people it was a, it was a 70s uh, fancy dress? I should have sent a photo and put it up on the screen. And, and you went as? I went as Roller Girl. So and I had white roller skates with the, lo- the wheels that lit up and hot pink lycra pants with a sequined hot pink bra. And Kirk Pengilly, your husband, went as... He was a pimp. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and is it true that you were still in the roller, the, the roller blades? Of the I was still in the roller skates. I put them on at 6pm and I took them off at 2. And I stayed upright all night. I was pretty happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good balance. Good. Balance and coordination. And a good birthday. And a great birthday. We got shut down by the cops, so it was a good birthday. <laughs> <laughs>
I was going to ring Andrew Skippy and you go, what the hell, buddy? Come on, I only turned 60. I'm oh, 40 once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> through through those, those, those abandonment years, do you, do, you, do you not like people praising you today? Do you, do you find it hard because you are so determined? And so I guess, you know, you're in, you're in that bubble and you're sort of, I don't know, maybe you're a little bit on your own sometimes when you, when you feel that. I do tend to isolate myself, uh-huh. absolutely, especially when I feel that I've become too reliant on somebody, then all of a sudden I give them an excuse to push, push me back. away and yeah. I push them away. Yeah. But I'm, a, I'm aware of that now, so I, I've changed the behavioural pattern. I accept compliments daily. I have no problem. People go, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but you're an inspiration. <laughs> don't be sorry. <laughs> I'm happy to be told, but I don't take it on very well. No. I, I have a, sh- a force field around me. And certainly don't, don't go you. looking for it. No, certainly not. No. no. Um, but I appreciate it. I appreciate the time that people want to take to to come and compliment me or, or talk about how I've either inspired them or motivated them. And, and I appreciate compliments, and I'm also willing to give them as well, but it's not something I, that I seek. Um, mm. And it's not some, it took me a long time to even learn how to accept them. I, my geography teacher in year 10 taught me the value of just having to say thank you. That's all you have to say, because people are telling you this also to make themselves feel good. And if you can just turn around and say thank you so they know they've been heard, that makes all the difference in the world. It just takes 10 seconds to leave a, a lasting positive impact on people's lives, you know. And, and I always want people to turn around and walk away from me with a smile on their face, with a positive impression. And there's no second chance at a first impression, so I, I make sure it's a good one. Whereas a negative impression is, is, is really worse yes. and will continue for years yeah, out there well, wherever it, goes it is. Forever, exactly. And yeah. I've, I've encountered that with some celebrities where I just won't forgive them for being a bitch to me the first time I met them. Um, like Kelly Slater. Oh, he's a bastard. But yeah. no, no, actually, I love Kelly. He's like my big brother. You know, I, I, I've had some some celebrities where you just get a sour taste and you just can't be bothered um, speaking nicely about them. But but people have bad days, and that's what you have to accept. Once again, you become what you judge, and so I've I've become more forgiving of myself, which then has become more forgiving of others, and I'm not so hard anymore. I was really hardened especially during those six years of winning those, those six world titles. You know, I was, it was about, I must do it. It was, if you're not with me, get the hell out of my way. I'm on a mission and I'm going to trample on you. I'm just going to keep clawing my way to the top. But then I had a, a severe neck injury where a wave that was about eight foot landed on the back of my neck and it herniated a disc, severed 80% of my spinal cord and I was out of the water for six months. And that really put life back into perspective. You know, when you can't do something you love, you've got to really start to analyse and prioritise and assess what's important to you. Mm. Made me realise my health is the most important thing to me. I learned that through chronic fatigue as well. So then when I came back to compete for my seventh world title, it was a completely different attitude, a completely different attitude, because the first six must have driven out of fear. My seventh one was achieved out of love. It was gratitude, it was appreciation. So from sitting in the water just fighting for it, to then three years later winning my seventh world title, sitting in the water going, wow, how beautiful is it today? How amazing are these waves? Wow, the water's so warm. I can't believe I'm sitting in Peru. Next week we'll be in Brazil. After that we're going to Hawaii. This is amazing. You know, I was so appreciative of the fact that I could first compete, second surf without pain, and third, I still believe that I had the ability to win. So that seventh one was as satisfying as the first one. You, make, you mentioned that you, and, and I've heard you speak of it before, that, um, that men's surfing gets so much more not only attention but, uh, but money as well. Um, that's changed a little bit, but really not much. Can just give us an idea of figures. What, what was that, that one-time champion he was, earning compared to you at six times? If you don't, well, not I, earning, as a six times world champion, prize money. I was... Um, God, I think he was, you know, he was probably on like a million dollars a year or something, and I was maybe on two hundred grand a year. Right, six times right. champion. So, so yeah. five, we're talking five times. Five times. Yes, yeah, right. and he'd won one and I'd won six. Unbelievable. Um, so that was incredibly frustrating. So We're not very supportive of women in sport, are we? No, we're not. Unless you're sexy or, I don't know, there's, there's a... What is it? Why? I, 
You work in the media. I don't, I don't <laughs> give, but, but is it the public as well? I'm certainly the media, without a doubt. But yeah. is it the public as well? I mean, 51% of the population are women. Why? Yeah. Why is it well, still a man's world? It is still a man's world, but we're changing that, aren't we, guys? Yeah, good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, um, there's, I've done a lot of talks, actually, especially from Macquarie Bank, about gender diversity and the importance of embracing it and the importance of of embracing difference of opinion and, and having diversity in all realms, not just in gender, but in, in skill set and ideas. And so when, it, when I sat on the board of directors of the ASP for 15 years as the women's executive director, while I was competing and winning world titles, I got to see firsthand the draconian chauvinistic attitude of the surfing industry. And it, it disappointed me because... I felt that the women's tour was as worthy as the men's tour, but the industry felt completely the opposite because I said, okay, guys, the women's tour, the prize money for 18 girls is a total of $30,000. We're all travelling the world to win five grand every event. You know, the first, my first world title, I think I won about 60 grand because I won a lot of events. Compared to the guys Compared who were winning... Compared to the guys who were winning hundreds of thousands, thousands of dollars, right? Right. And then saying that Kelly Slater was, you know, on millions of dollars and I was on 25 grand. So I decided that I'm going to continue to fight for the women's rights at the executive level. So it got to the point where we started to get the prize money up and I said, listen, guys, I'm no longer sponsored. I'm the only, spo- only surfer on the world tour that ever dropped her sponsor. <laughs> Silly. But I did it. <laughs> anyway... Um, I sit, I, when I was sitting there, I was like, okay, now I'm doing the tour without any money. I know what's required as a bare minimum to get this across the line. I need a prize purse of $100,000 because I'm going to one-off events in Brazil, Peru, Hawaii, France. It costs a lot of money to fly to these places. And then we're just living off our prize money if we don't have endorsement deals. So I thought if we have a minimum of hundred grand, then that way all the girls will make money no matter where they're travelling from. They'll actually have a viable income. So I said that to the industry and they sat on the board and looked at me and went, well, it's not worth it. And, I, and they said, and secondly... If we pay you more, the guys will actually realise that percentage-wise, you girls are earning more than they are, and we don't want to pay the guys more, so no, we're not going to do it. So I went, well, screw you, I will. And so that's when I went off and established the Beachley Classic, and it maintains its status as the richest standalone women's surfing event in the world. I had the first year at 100 grand. It took the industry three years to match me, and I've kept going up ever since. So I'm at 140, they're at 110. They'll reach me one day. <laughs> I've, I've also, in my principled manner, I've also kept the event out of the surfing industry, and there's not one surfing industry sponsor associated with it. Isn't it? Right. No. 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 Rip in your wetsuits, because they're the best wetsuits, but, but um, Commonwealth Bank and the New South Wales government and, and um, Chobani, like all the other little small sponsors have, have really supported it, got behind it. Um, I'm, 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 I'm wind up shortly. You're such an easy person to speak to. I haven't even got off page page one of my three pages of questions. I talk here. too much. No, no, no. You, you, you're easy to talk. And so, what's next? What's I mean, apart from your foundation? Oh, well, you, you're doing the, your new program with the Year Sevens. Yeah. So that's really my next focus. I know we weren't going to touch on the fact well, I had a, a clothing brand for five years. One of my motivations when I left my clothing sponsor from the surfing industry was to once again prove them wrong. I love proving people wrong and. I wanted to come out and create a, a clothing brand and I failed dismally at that five times. But I learned a lot from the process. And I, as it got to the fifth time, I was sold nationally through Maya and Rebel and had, had a really solid brand out there. But I had to take stock and for once when it wasn't working, I stepped back and analysed the whole process and went, the people aren't right, the product's not right, the branding's not right, the distribution's not right. Do I have the skill set and the passion to make it right? No. And that's where the honesty was really important for me. So when I stepped back, shut that door and went, okay, what's next? Opportunities came to me. And I know a lot of people are afraid to step outside and cut the string. You know, we do a things a lot of we do a lot of things with a still with a string attached, making sure that there's a that there's a safety net. Whereas I'm I'm so gung ho, I'm so heading forward and I'm so driven by achievement that failure is not an option. I don't consider it to not work. So when my brand didn't work, it was an overwhelming failure to me. And so when I realised that it's not a failure, it's a learning opportunity, cut the string, I find myself at the Olympics with an abundance of time, 
And now I've just developed a inspiring program for Year 7 students that I'm taking into all schools across the nation next year. It's called Be Inspired. It's about it's built on the three pillars of inspiration, individuality, and initiative. Teaching kids about goal setting, which we never really learn in school, teaching them about the importance of embracing the individuals that they are and how they can show more initiative and more support for each other, their friends and their family, to then go on and achieve what they truly desire, because I feel kids have really lost direction. Mm, yeah. that's, what I'm, that's what I'm motivated to do now, is to give back to kids. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Lane Beecher. <laughs> thank you.